What if I told you that the technology you use every day, the technology you see as new, cutting edge, or maybe even futuristic, isn't futuristic at all? What if I told you that it was invented a long time ago by the United States government, classified, kept secret from everyone? First of all, the very thing you're using right now to watch this video, the internet. Back in the 1960s, DARPA developed ARPANET, a network designed for academic and military research. It was all about secure data exchange between defense and academic institutions. And for years, its potential to revolutionize communication is the very thing that kept it classified. I mean, back then, just sending an email was a tightly held secret. And even after it was declassified, the internet still remained mainly a tool of the government until this guy, Tim Berners-Lee, did something about it. He grew up in London, around his parents, who were both mathematicians. His family embraced computers, instilling a concrete interest in computing from a young age. Yes, the government did create the internet, but they made it for sharing classified documents and communicating internally. Tim Berners-Lee, however, had a very different vision for the future of this technology. In 1989, he made the protocols that would go on to enable the World Wide Web, a user-friendly way of navigating and sharing information across computers. The World Wide Web was a game changer. I mean, it let us navigate the internet with ease. But what about navigating in the real world? Well, that's where you might need GPS. Think about how crazy it is that I can ask my watch to navigate to the store, and it doesn't just show me exactly where the store is, but the precise location of me. Siri. Navigate home. Back in the Cold War, the United States military needed a way to know where their troops, ships, and missiles were at all times. That's where GPS came in. It was a network of satellites orbiting Earth, sending signals down to receivers, and that enabled the pinpointing of locations with some seriously precise timing. But the military kept it under wraps, because let's be honest, giving away that kind of power wasn't an option during the Cold War. But in 1983, there was a tragic incident. Korean Air Flight 007 accidentally flew into Soviet airspace and was shot down. And as sad as it is, it made people realize that GPS could be used to save civilian lives, not just win wars. So President Reagan declassified it, making GPS available to everyone. However, the military did still have their own super precise version. And here's the cool part. By the year 2000, those restrictions were lifted and GPS suddenly became what we know it as today. It has the application of, of being put on anything that flies, that floats, that rolls down a road, that crawls on tracks or on a man's back. For the navigation system called Navstar, which ought to solve everybody's problem. But remember, it took a literal plane crash to convince the United States to declassify this amazing technology that's now used in smartphones, smartwatches, and drones around the world. Oh yeah, and speaking of drones. We can now fly tiny machines through the sky and use them to deliver packages, record landscapes, or even race them for sport. But the concept of drones, you guessed it, isn't new. The first drones date all the way back to World War I. This is the Kettering Bug, and it's what was called an aerial torpedo which is basically just a glorified flying bomb. It could strike targets up to 75 miles away while cruising at up to 50 miles an hour, all with no pilot. Yes, it's impressive, but it was clunky, unreliable, and couldn't do much besides crashing into targets. I mean, compare that to today's drones that can hover with pinpoint accuracy, shoot 4K video, all at an arguably affordable price. But back then, drones weren't about fun or convenience. They were about military strategy. During the Cold War, drones became high-tech tools for spying, allowing the government to gather intelligence without risking any human lives. And by the early 2000s, advanced models like the Predator redefined warfare with remote strikes and real-time surveillance. And all of this went to prove how far technology had come. To be clear, drones weren't necessarily classified, they were just in the shadows. I mean, it wasn't really even considered that futuristic unmanned aerial aircraft could be a product for consumers. By the 2010s, drones had already become cheaper, smaller, and easier to use. They were in the hands of photographers, engineers, and even hobbyists. 
Drones have gone from being a symbol of control and conflict to a symbol of possibility, proof that even the most exclusive technologies can benefit everyone. We're about to get into touchscreens and how CERN used them before anyone else. But first, I wanna tell you about today's sponsor, SpikeX AI, an incredible platform that makes content creation a breeze. SpikeX helps you optimize YouTube videos with AI-powered tools, from generating ideas to writing scripts, and even posting directly to multiple platforms like Shorts and Reels. It's perfect for creators who want to grow faster and produce high-quality content without the stress. And the best part, they offer 24-7 support, plus some exciting upcoming features like AI video generation and multi-platform posting. For just $31 a month, you can level up your content game. You can use my link in the description for a special 5% discount. And remember, SpikeX is your ultimate content creation partner. All right, touchscreens. Today, they're everywhere, from our smartphones to our cars to even our kitchen appliances. But I've always wondered, how were they first used? And how did the touchscreen go from being kept secret by its creators to becoming one of the most looked at objects on the planet? One ordinary finger and one rather extraordinary TV screen. It works like magic. You don't need a stylus. You can do multi-finger gestures on it. Wherever my finger goes, it all started in the 1970s at CERN, which is the European Organization for Nuclear Research, famously known for its massive Hadron Collider. But CERN isn't just about smashing particles together, it was a hub for revolutionary tech. It's where the first resistive touchscreen was designed by British engineer, Dr. G.S. Samuel Hurst. Initially, Hurst wasn't even worried about consumer products. I mean, the touchscreen was designed to interact with data systems more intuitively in highly specialized environments like particle physics experiments. The thin glass touchscreens that ship with smartphones today are called capacitive touchscreens, and they're actually pretty different from the resistive touchscreens that were made at CERN. The resistive touchscreen at CERN used pressure sensitive technology. It worked by layering a conductive and a resistive sheet with a gap in between. When pressed, the layers made contact, pinpointing the exact location of the touch. Think of a resistive touchscreen as what you might have found on an older ATM. Not quite what's on this. Okay, here's where things take a turn. The technology wasn't just left to CERN. Governments quickly recognized its potential, particularly for military applications. From targeting systems to early forms of command and control interfaces, resistive touchscreens were deployed in secretive projects and the secrecy was intense. Many of these systems were locked behind military contracts and classified protocols. Engineers were bound by non-disclosure agreements and the tech wasn't allowed to spill into consumer markets for decades. Okay, so how did we get from a secret government technology to something that ships with over a billion smartphones every year? Let's fast forward to 2007 in San Francisco where visionary Steve Jobs walked in front of a room full of media and tech journalists and released one of the most radical inventions of our time, the iPhone. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. Why so much buzz about yet another personal device? This was the moment that changed everything. We are calling it iPhone. Apple's use of capacitive touchscreens, developed from years of refinement in labs, introduced the world to intuitive gestures, swipes, pinches, and multi-touch. The iPhone didn't just popularize touchscreens, it redefined what technology could quite literally feel like. But Apple wasn't the only player. ATMs, kiosks, and PDAs were already dabbling with resistive touchscreens. But what Apple did was make it intuitive and consumer friendly. Capacitive touch, which required no physical pressure at all and allowed for fluid motion, felt like magic. And the world couldn't get enough. It feels so weird to know that something as simple as swiping to unlock your phone started in the halls of CERN and military labs. Look, I just talked about the internet, GPS, drones, and touchscreens, but if you think those are the only inventions kept secret by the government that are now commonplace, you'd be badly mistaken. You can't forget about email, which was invented by ARPANET in the 1970s with the first message being an unremarkable test that wasn't even saved, or duct tape, developed during World War II to waterproof ammunition cases and later become household essential. Microwave radar was designed during World War II for detecting enemy aircraft. Weather satellites originated in the 1960s to monitor Earth's climate. Night vision was first developed for soldiers in World War II to spot enemies in complete darkness. 
Fiber optics were originally created for military communications to securely transmit data over long distances. Infrared cameras were initially used by the military for surveillance in detecting enemy movements in the dark. Velcro became a household name after NASA used it in space missions to secure tools and gear in zero gravity. Membrane foam was invented by NASA in the 1960s to improve aircraft seat cushioning for astronauts. Autonomous vehicles were first prototyped for military use in the 1980s to carry supplies and reduce soldier risk. Synthetic rubber was invented during World War II when the natural rubber supplies were cut off by enemy forces. And don't forget about solar panels, which were first improved by NASA to provide reliable energy to satellites in space. All right, everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like or maybe even subscribe. And if you did enjoy this video, you probably like this one. It's, uh, it's a pretty cool video, all right? Peace.